Beg your pardon, madam. We didn't mean to disturb, but may we... Come, but of course, please. But who are these gentlemen? Europeans. To be precise, they're Italians. Uh, journalists. They've come here to the South to conduct an inquest. Is that the proper expression? On slavery. Indeed, they seem to be quite shocked. What is their religion? They're Catholics, I believe. You are Catholic, are you not? Uh, yes, uh, Roman Catholic. Well, they shouldn't feel too shocked. After all, their Pope, who's most generous with his excommunications, has yet to excommunicate a traitor in black flesh. Unless they eat it on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> excommunication? Catholic priests here in the South, between one Our Father and another Hail Mary, they raise goats and slaves. And I must confess, they know their business. The last seven males I bought were sold to me by the St. Inigo Jesuits in Maryland. Finest bunch I ever bought. <laughs> <laughs> but why are they here, then? I could be wrong, but perhaps it's because they, too, are slaves. You know how Catholics are. Slaves to the fascination of sin. <laughs> perhaps it might be their oppositionist instinct. You know, Europeans, ever since the French Revolution, They've been attacking everything. But, madam, times have changed. Rousseau, Diderot, Voltaire. Now, it's Catholics who read the devil's own books. Oh, what would His Holiness in Rome have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> please, please, these gentlemen are my guests. And I myself have allowed them to move freely about the house. So they can learn who really are the slaves and masters here. Senator, don't, please. No chicken bones, I beg of you. I've had to take two of them to the veterinaries already this week. Well, at this point, I have a suggestion that might enlighten our friends from Italy. All of you at this table are distinguished people, and it would be most illuminating to hear your frank and authoritative views on the subject of slavery. For you know what Europeans say about us. 
that we have a guilt complex and won't talk about it. I agree, and I shall speak first. We cannot hide slavery any more than we can hide an erupting volcano, a forest fire, or leprosy. In my own case, it is true that I have freed my slaves because they were stupid, foul-smelling, sad, and bothersome. I'm an aristocrat. I believe in freedom, but not equality. That is my statement. Signed, John Randolph of Roanoke. I'm Professor Thomas R. Zoo. In history, we know that every great civilization was founded on slavery. Let us take the classic examples of Greece and the Rome from whence you gentlemen come. It's God's and nature's law that man attempt to prevail over his fellow man. Till so one becomes the master, one becomes the slave. Let us remember that God is white and is law. God is white, we prevail over all other races. Oh, sorry, Professor. What was that you said? God is white. And as long as God is white, we shall prevail over all other races. Beg your pardon, Professor, but with all this confusion, would you mind repeating? God is white. And as long as God is white, we shall prevail over all other races. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other viewpoints? Perhaps I, too, may say something to these gentlemen from Europe. I am not a southerner. My name is Harriet Beecher Stowe, and I'm from New England. I've been here but a few days, but even in that shorter span, I've formed a personal opinion. May I state it? Please do. Even if I share the universal opinion that the black race is indisputably inferior to all other races, I must, on the other hand, also state that slaves are of human origin and do have an embryonic intelligence. Oh, really? I do not hesitate to tell you that I entertain for the suffering slave a degree of sympathy which equals the disgust I hold for those who make him suffer. I am an American who no longer understands her southern kinsmen. And this tragic fact distresses me deeply. I can feel it. Yes, I can feel it. The wind has changed. It has turned. Are we to have a thunderstorm? And is this not a forecast of even more violent storms that may cause our great country's unity to falter? I have heard God's voice. And his word has told me to write a story, to write a book. I think I'll call it Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it is my great hope that it will enlighten and ease our souls. Fire! Fire! The Civil War cost America a million dead. For every Negro brought from Africa, a white man fell in battle, and their bones were collected by these old slaves whose freedom was bought with the white man's life. This was the price America paid, first to free itself, and then the rest of the world from the institution of slavery. An institution America had not invented, but had inherited and endured. The historic personages we met at Mrs. Carsten's dinner table, like all the others we will meet on our journey into the past, lived and breathed nearly a century and a half ago, when they never could have imagined that one day soon their scattered bones would be harvested by black hands. Now revisited in their actual surroundings, they will do and say exactly what they did and said once upon a time, when the peculiar economy of the South, the morals of the times, certain scientific beliefs, 
and even various passages of the Bible authorize the white man to relegate the black to the existence of a domesticated animal, without intelligence, without a soul. But this was only one half of America. The other half took arms, killed and was killed. And the former slaves, now freed, are employed by the government at 75 cents a day to collect these sacrificial bones and give them burial in thousands of nameless graves. What a stink, Captain. What did you bring, a cargo of rotten meat? What do you mean? This is all prime beef. They stink because they eat like pigs. Then they vomit all over themselves. Long voyage? 95 days from the Ivory Coast. Whew. Don't you ever take them up on deck for a little fresh air? With all the frigates nosing around these waters like hungry dogs? Times have changed, Mr. Sims, now that our damn Yankee government considers this cargo contraband. <laughs> they catch me with even one nigger on board. It's up the rope I go, and I wouldn't be the first. They're bound to rot away down there in that cesspool. Not on your life. Aboard my ship, hygiene's the rule. That means a clean ship, clean cargo. When one of them gets took bad, I don't wait till he plagues the others. No, sir. It's into the brining with them, then and there. Captain Wicks delivers the goods in perfect condition. Anyone will tell you that. How many head you got? 326, including the wench. <laughs> this batch is all staggered. No syphilis, and they've all busting with seed. Well, look how rested they are. I travel some comfort. Each one got a space six foot by two foot. Well, they can even turn around. Now, uh, real stallion. Every night they so hot for pleasure and they all humping each other like a pack of dogs. And chains don't stop no how. And here's the winches. All of them got pups and near all are pregnant again. How many? 112. You go $300 each? You touched Captain? You know I don't buy by the head, I buy by the pound. Oh, all right. Say $200. By the pound, I said. Hey, what are you doing, drowning them? I told you, rule number one, hygiene. Three showers a day, salt water kills their fleas and lice. Then you ring them and hang them out to dry, I reckon. <laughs> God almighty, what a pest hole. That's diarrhea. Just busting with health, ain't they, you old pirate? It happened now and then, but we know how to cure it. The usual cure? It's the oldest and the surest. Sugar cane plug, oakum, and tar. And bam, ram it in hard. Keeps the bowels locked up tight and the soul from escaping from the back door. How come he don't blow up? Cork will pop out first, just like a bottle of champagne. <laughs> hey, what's that slop? Well, that's molasses and beef grease. Diggers goes crazy for them. Have to trust them and feed them a little at a time, otherwise they'd choke themselves on it. Looking at him, you wouldn't think so. That one, he's taken it into his head to starve himself to death. A real pitiful case. Hey, Doc, chisel, hammer, and funnel. Go ahead and serve dinner. Let's say $150 a head. You're just breaking wind again. By the pound, I said. The whole cargo to dollar a pound. Two dollars. Dollar twenty-five. Dollar seventy-five. Dollar fifty. So, I'll regret it, but it's a dick.
Well, nothing else to show you. One sugar cane per head, and I take back their personal effects for my next cargo. Naked I bought them, and naked I sell. All hands ashore. You two gentlemen, the voyage is over. How can it be? The ship hasn't made port. And she ain't a gunner. Too many busybodies ashore. You black bastard! That's it. Keep moving and watch where you are. You black bastard, come on! You bastard, come on! Give me that chain. Keep moving, Mr. Offbeat. Hey, Pluto, come here. Pluto, come over here right now. Come here, I said. You heard me. Give that here. Damn you, Pluto. Come here. I'll teach you to jump on your master's beak. <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? This is Fort Bastille, Louisiana's vast receiving station. Thomas Hewitt referred to it in his pamphlet. It says on page 106, it is ordered that all slaves upon arrival from Africa shall be placed in quarantine in Fort Bastille. Now listen to this, page 116. In iron cages, those afflicted with mange, scabies, ringworm, yaws, and other skin diseases are treated with the smoke of ailanthus leaves. Page 118. Epileptics are tied and hung by the feet and left dangling until the blood flooding the brain arrests the convulsions. <laughs> Here on page 122. It is obligatory that all new arrivals shall be given their first collective bath in water containing ashes, sand, and lysol. Page 130. From the bath, they go to be greased with an ointment of palm oil and camphor. The staff is well aware that 82% of the new arrivals suffer from contagious skin ailments and may not be sold until cured. Violators of this regulation are subject to punishment by law. By means of giant slides, the subjects pass on to the next stage, which is disinfecting and purging. goes on to say, lice and fleas that may have survived the preceding treatment will be exterminated by the complete destruction of their natural habitat. The razor made of top quality steel is to be sharpened after each 200 shaves so as to avoid the possibility of damaging the scalp. Well, come in, come on in, gentlemen. There's nothing to be scared of. Erythema. Pleased to meet you, Dr. Erythema. Oh, no, I'm Doc White. Yeah, come closer. You see, uh, the disease is erythema. Uh, caught her from these filthy nigger asses, don't you know? Uh, all right, bring her on over. Come on, come on. Now, you can look all your life, but mind you, don't touch nothing. It's dangerous. Uh, come over here. Let's see if I can give you a clean bill of health as a stud. <laughs> oh, that's it. Bring it here to me now. 
The skittish is a stallion, eh? You're scared this is gonna pinch your nose? <laughs> no, no. Ain't your nose that you can cause trouble with. Yeah, let me see if that stovepipe's in order. Yeah, scrotum? Uh, foreskin? Hey, now what is this? A flag raising? Uh, come on, put that black snake away. <laughs> All wenches with pups, step forward. Give me that bag of bones. Let's go. Infant mortality, 60%. Principal causes, syphilis, dysentery, tuberculosis. Eh, good thing the females is always hey, pregnant. They averages one and a half pups a year. And then they cut the umbilical cord with their teeth and their tetanus takes over. And what thanks to us veterinarians get for our efforts. Hmm? Yeah, you see, they pee on us, that's what. And their mothers tie off the cord with horse hair. Results? And they're <laughs> Abscess and umbilical hernia. Yeah, when you come down to it, what's a gentleman like me doing being a veterinarian? food rations? I can understand why they need an enema. <laughs> Actually, it's not bad. A pint of cornmeal per head, half a pint of beans, half a pound of yams, three pounds of pork fat. Whoa! Get your facts straight. Just two pounds of fat. We don't need any favors from you. All right, go ahead. gobble anything you give them. Eating and pleasuring, that's what they want. And they want to survive. They survive everything. Whippings, syphilis, cholera, the heat, the cold. Their strength is their adaptability. Come heaven or hell, they'll fill their bellies and spew out dozens of pups. Now let me tell you something. I take my stand in favor of compulsory castration. Not out of meanness, you understand. But if we don't cut a few thousand of these black balls now, then in a hundred, two hundred years... Where are they taking them? Benson Parish, the end of the line. From there they start the long march through the wilderness. What shall we do? Follow them? No, no, no. We'll wait for them at the swamp outside of Baton Rouge. Oh, we'd better hurry up though before the rainy season begins. Now, from the railhead, the caravan proceeds on foot toward the great slave markets. Hey, what's that red flag? The red flag is a symbol of slavery. That's so. And the band? 
to keep up their morale so they'll make a good appearance when they arrive at the market. Gracias, Dave. By the grace of God, you're free. Ite con gracias, Dave. By the grace of God, you're free. By the grace of God, you're free. Ite con gracias, Dave. By the grace of God, you're free. Ite con gracias, Dave. By the grace of God, you're free. All right, Father. $300 for the males. $200 for the females. $100 for the cops. Agreed, yeah? Ite con gracias, Dave. Well, goodbye then, Father. Remember me when you have any more goods to set free, yeah? By the grace of God, you're free. Historically exact, when commanded by Rome to no longer hold slaves, the Jesuits of the monastery of St. Inigo in Maryland, instead of liberating their slaves, sold them. After a long day's march, the merchants allowed the slave caravans a few hours of rest on deserted plantations in the wilderness and in sugar mills where water was always abundant. Who, who are those four? We have an appointment with them tonight. I'll explain later. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah? Oh, Johnny. Please, don't make trouble, hmm? Eh, shit up. It's my friend, Buzz. This is Sonny. This here is Jake. Well, then, are you coming? But isn't this illegal? Illegal? What's legal in this goddamn place? Money, master. Money. Ah, uh, it's money he wants. Oh! There's your money. <laughs> Fine, fine, fine. Just fine. On your feet. Come on, come on. You see this herd? Old damn coffle belonged to one trader, because he rips a fat hog. God! Get out of my way! Go on! Move! You know how many poor folks there is like me in this county that ain't never owned a single one of these bastards? Eighty out of a hundred. Eighty that works for nothing and die of starvation. Make way for a white man. Get out of here. So there's no work for us in this shitty South, thanks to these dumb brutes. Come on, come on, well, let's go.
there's the slave trader. Let's talk to him now. Go on, call to him. Hey, Mr. Schultz, mind if we freshen up a little too? Hello, boys. I'm glad to see you. <laughs> it's not like that. You have to undo the buttons first. <laughs> You'll learn. It's you, because if you know how to treat them, they're not a really animal like people say. What you need is a good master. Like me, for example. You see, my profession has also its noble side. Some people call us peddlers of human flesh, zealous of souls. No, no, no. When you have a good conscience like mine, this work becomes a mission. Don't think for one moment that this is a lucrative profession. What do you think, for example, I make on this mail? Forty to fifty dollars if he doesn't get first a hernia, yeah? <laughs> And with the females, it's the same. Who? Oh, this wench. I think I'll do better with this one. I paid 250 for her. All right, all right, she's no virgin. But I should get 650 for her if Zambak fattens her up. <laughs> and the pubs, $120 a dozen. They'll bring 250 on the market. So you'll say, a profit of 80 to 120 percent. That's not bad. One moment, it's 420 miles from here to the market. And who pays for the ones who escape and the others who die on the way? If one out of three gets there, I'm lucky. Then feeding, clothing, casting, the lousy, weeping, then the taxes, the tolls. They have a robbers, the fever, then my health, my family. I have seven sons I never see. And the boys need a father, yeah? <laughs> Who's that? My sure, it's really him, Charlie Watson. You know that big banker in Natchez that went bankrupt? Well, he ausbutted all his creditors and the taxmen by investing all the bank's deposit in slaves and then marching them right out of the county. <laughs> hey! Charlie! Charlie Watson! Charlie! <laughs> How are you? Just like in the old days, yeah? I'm glad to see you, old friend. How have you been? Wash the dust out of your throat. And how's your son? How old is he now? Holway said he was the spitting image of his pa. Just like good old Charles. <laughs> Poor Charlie. Anyhow, it's better it was me. At least I was a friend. If the government men had caught him, they'd have honked him. This way, he died with his boots on. Mr. Schultz, what have you done? The law is the law. Niggas are bought and sold, but you have to pay your taxes. You got to be careful in this business. Because you know, this is liquid capital. And it cannot be exported without a license. Hey, Amos, hurt this along with the others. You are with the master says you're coming with us now. You mean, you're just going to take them? Why? Just because old Charles is dead and gone, you don't expect me to let him starve, do you? Without a master, Negus is just plain helpless, and I go to heart, you know. Hey, what if someone talks with all these witnesses? Who? Witnesses? Who? Them? Oh, <laughs> no. Have you ever seen a horse testify? No, for a horse. It's an animal like this, and the law speaks very clearly. No. No danger. If you... If you get any ideas... Who? Us? Let's get out of hey, here. Come on, run, run, run! I Come am! Back here. You, Macaronis! What happened, Cardo?
in. Come in. But I'm warning you, I haven't much time to look after you. You can see what a madhouse it is here. Ma'am? Now, what do you want? <gasps> the luggage. The luggage, ma'am? Mr. Thackeray's luggage, I've told you already. You must bring it right down. Back to work, all of you. You do as you please. Look, walk around, do all you want. I'll see y'all later. Yeah. Is this man? The sheets, ma'am. Ma'am. Let's go. Ma Let's go. What about the sheets? Ma'am? All is clean. All is clean. Must I always be cleaning things that's already clean? Fingers. My fingers are sore, ma'am. Always cleaning things. They get sore. Nights I dream about polishing things, ma'am. Like I was cleaning night, too. And my feet hurts, ma'am. What can I do about my feet? Like me, but egg with a glove on. Fine, bun, party to my hand, 
Mrs. Maxwell. Yes. Yes, Mr. Thackeray? Mrs. Maxwell, my stay with you and your family has been a thoroughly pleasant one. And I do not really want to again go into the matter of that peculiar institution. In your house, one of the typical southern homes of the privileged, you have some 30 slaves doing the same work that four or five servants do perfectly well in any comparable house in London. And these 30 Negroes are the pick of the lot out of some 80 or 90. Of the rest, 20 are sick or too old for work. 20 are too clumsy. 20 too young and have to be nursed and looked after by 10 more. For domestic purposes, my dear madam, it seems to me the most peculiar institution that can be devised. I wish to thank you for your hospitality, madam. Which, considering the enormous number of servants you have, must indeed have been exhausting. <laughs> Who was that? Thackeray, English historian who wrote that slaves were more of a liability than an asset to the Americans. Bye-bye. 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 Hey, why don't we interview them? Might be interesting uh, from a professional point of view. Forget uh, it. We already have an interesting appointment. With whom? The Reverend Stringfellow. Huh? The preacher, the one who is famous for his justification of slavery. Aren't you interested in hearing him? Why not? He's preaching today in the church at Turner's Bridge. You know the way? In that slave Mrs. Maxwell loaned us. He will lead us as far as Peterson Plantation. And after that, we'll have to ask the way. All right. Begging your pardon, madam, but can you direct us to Turner's Bridge? Drei Kilometer. Ich bin German, non good English sprechen. Uh, afraid I, I didn't understand. Two miles, look in der Straße. What's happening here, madam? Nothing. Touching, I'm black boy. But I've 20 virgins out at Peterson's place. <laughs> cutting? Cutting what? Yeah, the balls out of that negra. <laughs> oh, that studs throw. <laughs> <laughs> Let us oh, keep you. Ah, 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 
off at last. <laughs> but how did they do it? <laughs> With your tongues, be used for gelding. <laughs> but it's atrocious to make a man suffer that way. Nine, niggas, they don't feel nothing. <laughs> remind you that God condemned to slavery the damned posterity of Canaan in the days of Joshua. God ordained by express statute to Abraham's posterity that they should buy slaves and decreed that those slaves would be a perpetual inheritance for their children. God recognized Abraham as the owner of slaves he had bought, commanding him to circumcise them. And Jesus ordained that whosoever dared to raise seditious doubts as to the benevolence of the institution of slavery should be cast out and scorned not only as a danger to the state, but destructive to the true nature of the gospel. God decreed by law that slavery be honored and obeyed, being his ordainment. Jesus himself established by law the relation of master and slave. A master must exercise without any weakness his authority over the slave. The master must not hesitate to punish him severely, whipping him with the number of lashes commensurate to the offense. All this, dear brethren, is made known to us by the recorded language of the Bible. Slavery is therefore a divine institution ordered and sanctioned by God. Therefore, with all the authority invested in me by the church, I, Reverend Thornton Stringfellow of the state of Virginia, order you to honor slavery and not to discuss it on the basis of false moral premises. understood that their much vaunted virtue is decidedly undervalued from a moral viewpoint because it is a virtue without alternatives. My word. Indeed, they cannot be less than virtuous since it is a fact that their men are noted for their preference for colored girls. Their virtue is to be sure. Hi. They have no other choice. They are women unfulfilled since their husbands and possible lovers prefer the dusky charms of the plantation wenches, the fillies, the shows as they call them. These young colored girls bursting with lusty youth whom they enjoy so lecherously. Oh, well, oh, 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 How's it possible to write such film? Propaganda. Political propaganda. What can they know about Negroes and Negresses, these landless louts in Boston and Philadelphia? Nothing but their envy and prejudice. Their malice causes them to try and offend us, to debase and humiliate us. God in heaven, that they should insult our men, our husbands in this way. Shame to suggest that our men would have intercourse with our slaves who are little better than animals. Exactly. Dear God, it is an accusation of sexual aberration. Oh, this abnormal mating between black and white. There's a scientific word for it. It's called bestiality. Such disgusting lies. Do we not all know who are the objects of our husband's incontinence? We, wherever Friday night must undergo... Oh, what am I saying? <laughs> uh, 
Don't you all think it might be wiser not to speak too frankly in front of them? Don't worry. They understand about as much of white folks talk as the furniture does. But isn't it remarkable? The longer they stay among us, the lighter they get. Yet their mentality, sensitivity, and intelligence remain that of the brute animal. It's really true. Yes. It seems to me that each generation gets lighter. I know in our place, we keep having cubs with rosy skins. My husband says it's because of, uh, symbiosis. That's the scientific term, symbiosis. Like those animals who take on the color of the background in which they live. Your husband's absolutely right. It's true. Quite correct, my dear. Look at Scipio. He's left-handed like my brother. And see, Jason? My husband brought him up from childhood, and now, isn't it remarkable? He shows some of my husband's blondness. Extraordinary. Truly, nature is bizarre. <laughs> Do you think those women really believe all that nonsense about symbiosis? Could be, maybe, maybe not. Where are their husbands? Here in New Orleans at their townhouses, keeping an eye on business. Alone? Well, you saw their wives. They're in the country with the young people. Why don't we go and take a look? Of course. That's where we're going. One, two, three. Ah, that's just right. Uh, three black pepper cones with glass of port, and you have an excellent digestive. Eh? That's what I always say. Black is always tasty. Take, for instance, a nice piece of black meat, juicy and soft, even if it's slightly gamey. That's the best part, their gamey taste. Always so easy to digest, even if eaten at bedtime. <laughs> Much better than our weekly ration of white meat, a tasteless snack. At least you toss them and turn them all night long. <laughs> that may be true in this uncivilized country, but it cannot compare, as I have found, to the French. We've heard enough about your French bitches. Wait till he's married to a wife who thinks all men are disgusting animals. <laughs> then he can tell us what kind of fun he gets in her bed. Indeed, that is because you don't know how to put a dash of pepper in it. Truly, you are peasants, with the tastes of peasants. You like pepper in your pot, and the musky stench of your servants. Uncivilized. Easy, son. Easy. I have known other peasants like me and you to slip out of the bed of Madame Pompadour or some such bitch to find a tastier snack in Mammy's larder. <laughs> <laughs> you wenches. I show you who's boss around here. Show me your nails. You have been rubbing in the slops again. Get that filth from under your claws, slut. And you. Hold up your arms. I declare, smell straight from the cesspool. Go wash yourself with lasso. Maybe I'll come here. Now you open your jaws. Ah, garlic. You chomp on those clothes till your teeth falls out. And you, you always been a pretty clean wench. You almost no stink at all. Now you, turn round. Turn round, I say. Bend over. I don't mind admitting it, dear God. I'm mighty appreciative of all your... Come on in. Uh, just a moment, Let's follow those girls. As I was saying, dear Lord, I'm real obliged to you for all you've given this deserving but humble servant today and for all that I know you will give me tomorrow. I thank you for the wisdom you endowed me with at birth, the countless good deeds you inspire me to do. And I also reckon I should thank you for closing your divine eye to a few little transgressions I got planned for tonight. Come on, you. Get in here. But in humble sincerity, dear Lord, let me take this opportunity to thank you for my continuing stamina and finally for the riches you've already bestowed on me, which I'm sure you wish me to keep and to multiply. Amen. 
You like my prayer? I made it up myself. When a man knows good from evil, he's much better off making up his own prayers. Me and God, we get along good. As I see it, God created me in his image and likeness. That's in the Bible. That's why I'm white. Then he made the Negro, uh, which is also in the Bible, which says that he immediately regretted it and damned the entire race, leaving him without a soul fit only to be my slaves. Then with the night come these black ghosts, damned by God. I say ghost only because of their damn blackness. But they have a body. Ah, what a body. Look at her. <laughs> to avoid them is to lose God's battle. The supplement tonight is to conquer them, the victory of light over darkness. At my age, it's something of a task. But with God's help, my friend, and these. <laughs> well, it's late. I got work to do. Mammy! 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 Where are you, you black slut? You come here now. Move your big fat black ass. Come here, I said. I'm coming. I'm here. I'm right here, master. What wrong? Oh, idiot. What's wrong? You old fool. This is what's wrong. Did you or did you not send me this fraud? Why, master? How come you talk like that, master? I don't fraud nobody, master. That Helen, master, she a beautiful wench. You listen, you stupid black bitch. At 60, I don't give a damn for her beauty. You send me a virgin. Get rid of her. That's not possible. Wait, master, I send you another way more open. All right, girl. You come over here to me now, you hear? You got no change, slut. Come here. Tell me. No lies, you whore. You still virgin? Or can't he make it with you? Answer me, bitch. You still virgin? Yes or no? <laughs> you <laughs> You whore. Does you want me, massa? Uh, what's that child want you? What do you mean? Eyes, does you want me, Massa? Eyes bathed all over, and Massa, as a virgin. A virgin? My God, how old are you, child? Thirteen. What? Thirteen, I guess, according to Mammy. Thirteen? Thirteen? With such a child? It's still a child. My God, aren't you ashamed? So young. Does you want this first, Massa? Mammy told me sometimes white folks must play with this before they can pleasure the girls. This is madness. What wicked person taught you such things? Just imagine the trouble I'd be in if someone... Oh, my God, only 13, 13. You can't do this to me. No, no, Master, please. Don't send me away, please, Master. Quiet. Please, don't send me away. Please, please don't make please, so much Master, noise. Pleasure me. Pleasure me. What? Please, Master. Right now, here. Your bed is so big. And I'm so small. And if I take off my dress, I don't smell. Do I, Master? I don't smell. If you is really sleepy, Master, I won't bother you. But it's too bad, Master. I like you so much, Master. It would be so good with you, Master. And Mammy wouldn't beat me no more. This is unbelievable. Um, are you really a virgin? Oh, no, child. You see, if you must do it, it, it would be better with someone your own age and perhaps color. You mean with a black man, Master? No, no. I don't like black men, Master. No, Master. I can't stand black men. Once, so Mammy wouldn't whip me, I had to try it. He hurt me, Master. Too big, too strong. White man is smaller, Master. Better for the first time. And they not smell, Master. Oh, Master. Master, please. Please do it to me, Master. Mm, Master. Thank you, Master. Mm, Master.
Take him home. Two hundred dollars. He's a steal. Three hundred. Four hundred. No, no, no. You can keep him then. Step right up, folks. Don't lose a chance of a lifetime. One dollar. One dollar only. You may win prizes worth fifty thousand. Badu, Capri, Golano, Queens for Ivory Coast, Oakland, Virginia. Only a few tickets still available, so hurry, hurry, hurry. And win yourself a fabulous prize for just one dollar. Step right. right up, folks. Here's the chance you're waiting for. Sensation of low prices and fair and fair. The best bags in the country going for fun. Step right up, folks. Call yourself a little bit. Practically nothing. Kindly observe them show plays, Mrs. Jack. Every one of them practice. You ever see such a fly one in the last one? They may be yours. Now, yeah. Look at that flat knee. 65 to 68 pounds. Need about another five pound weight to balance them cups on me. You never mind adding no more weight. All right, son. The customer always right. Shall we set up for that, say, 170 pound of a sort of picking at All right. Look at these spaniels. Inspect them real close. Horse breed full of seed. Just look at those attributes. Look at them. And touch them, pinch them, and wham them in your hand. Oh, this little angel is certainly the prettiest of any we've seen in the market. Oh, it's really such an enchanting creature. Oh. Well, then, what shall we do, sister? It's hard to say no, isn't it? But have you heard the prices? No, I'm afraid it's too expensive. But he's such an angel, and he's so healthy. The Mother Superior would like it. Let's buy. Sister, now, can you just imagine what she'd say? She's already bought four this year. Oh, dear. I do want it so. $300 isn't so much. Maybe if we offer $200. Look, I'm, I'm the only one who's got these keys. You hear? Hey, uh, inside all your passes, I'll have your whip. I'll show you some master around here. These things belong to me. Huh? I, I give the orders here. I'm the general. The general. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Open up. Open up. Open up, you whores. I'm the, I'm the general. Open up, you black apes. Out of my way. Move, you hear? Hey, master. Look at this merchandise I got custody of. I'm the general of the slave market guards. You see this? It's the market vault. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Wenches all prime grade meat and every one of the sluts a virgin. <laughs> Get to work, nigga. Now this one, she not even a full-blooded nigga. Damn near all of them got at least half of them blood in the veins. Like me. All of them sold, <laughs> ready to be delivered. <laughs> Gift wrap. Hey, masters, look. Uh, look, but don't judge, huh? <laughs> you mustn't handle the merchandise. No, no, no. Only the general's allowed to do that. Oh, you want to see? This is Cassandra, half-breed. Fabulous. Just look. Just look at that. Harrison Breeding Farm, daughter of Zephira and the Great Diarchal. Archimedes, three-quarters human blood. Nicest pair of tits in the store. <laughs> Five thousand dollars cash on the barrel head with a two-year guarantee. Vintage of 48. Imperial Reserve, rosy pink, blend bond. This is Eve. Hey, Eve, Eve, you like apples? Well, then go on and eat them. Eat them, eat them. But don't let that black snake get you. <laughs> a pair like these you'll never see. A pair like these you'll... Uh, a pair like these... Oh, forget it. I don't care if you never see them. Come on, come on. I ain't got no more time to waste. I'm the general. Open up, open up, open up, open up. Go on, go on, keep dancing, you. You, you clown. What are you waiting for? Go on, dance, 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 dance. Nesting doves without feathers. Watch me, I'll show you how. Like that! 
shoulders. Oh, now don't shake your shoulders. Shake your ass. I could go out of my mind getting them ready, and they ain't such demand. They rip them out of my hands before I'm finished. Come on, darling, show yourself these nice men. Please, gentlemen, go ahead. Look around all you like. Not bad, huh? Guess what they cost? Five hundred dollars? One thousand? Two thousand? Uh-uh. Three thousand? <laughs> going to guarantee that they really are twins. They might be genuine. They might also be a fraud. Fraud? This is a serious firm known all through the South. Take a look at this pair. Dirty face. This is rare stuff. They are authentic by Keller. They are signed while look here. Quiet, quiet. Open the door. It's me, the general. Come in, come in. But no bids. These are museum pieces fit for kings and queens. <laughs> this one's price is $15,000. What's so special about him? He's got three. Three. One, two, three. 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 One, two, three. He's got three. One, two, three. Uh, let's see now, page 910, yes. A mixture of paraffin, linseed oil, and essence of orange peel. This ointment is rubbed into the skin of slaves, especially the females, before exposing them on the auction block. It serves the dual purpose of improving the appearance of their skin by hiding the presence of carbuncles and of camouflaging the pungent animal odor of the African race. This anointing is practiced generally, but particularly in Georgia and Alabama. Hey, where are y'all from? From Rome. Rome, Georgia? Rome, Italy. Yankees, go home. Thank you, Master. Thank you, Master. Yes, Master. Yes, Master. Please, Master. Please, Master. And now, you all pay attention to me. And you too pay attention when I'm talking to you here. Here's where you look when you find yourself in front of a white man. Here, at the toe of his boot. Now, you over there, I want you to repeat. Thank you, master. Thank, Thank you, master. master. Yes, master. Yes, yes master. master. Please, master. Please, Please master. master. And you, never look a white man in the eye. You hear me? Never. Look at me. Thank you, master. Not in the face, you bastard. Now remember that. Order efficiency cleanliness. Without them, the county archive show would be an unholy mess. But fortunately, I'm the only one that can handle these here records. Order would it be file 8266 land L? Hmm, Pinto. Better watch out. Just saw a rat in there. Oh, he don't bite. A rat as big as a cat. That's Mickey. Placed in place, eh? Huh? Oh, oh, here it is. Now, Stu, I don't see so well. Why haven't they yet learned how to turn out a legible policy? Can you read it? Sure can. Got good eyesight. I'll just read the essentials, huh? The object covered by insurance in the policy is Negro slave name of Charles. Uh, beneficiary being covered in the event of slave drowning or causing damage to third parties or self-destruction, sabotage, smallpox, or insan. Insan? Insanidation? Insanity? Hmm. He's missing here. Ed by Mickey. Who's Mickey? Ah, uh, the wretched sir a while back. Well, which is it? Insanitation or insanity? Oh, what's the difference? The insurance company don't pay no how. And this here's the inventory list. Feet and ankles insured, likewise shin bone, knee and thigh bone. Uh, genital area, nothing worth insuring here. Liver covered, also heart. 
I guess he's got one. Uh, teeth? Can't he show what he ain't got? Uh, how long are you insuring him for? One year policy, all right? He ain't gonna last no longer than that. Anything else? I believe not. <laughs> all right, then. Sorry, who's got a pen? A pen? Uh, here's one. Thank you, sir. Don't mention it. Here, sign here. Clearly and legibly. Full name on the dotted line. Johan Jerome Gutenberg. Paul, you? Nero. Julius Caesar. Gabriel. Alexander the Great. Lucifer. Name. Judas. Butterfly. Dear. Achilles. Sam's. Excuse us, sir. My colleague and I are here to conduct an inquiry. Uh, may we ask you a few questions? Yes, please, Master. I'm at your disposal. Uh, you're here, as it were, to be sold, no? Of course. We, we are truly appalled, sir. We can imagine how you must feel, you, your fear, your indignation. On the contrary. Why, in my career, I have always been very lucky. I've had masters, each one more humane than the next. But haven't you ever been treated brutally, whipped, beaten, tortured? In our profession, what counts is to do one's duty. <laughs> Don't listen to all those stories about the various Uncle Toms and Simon Legrees and so on. It's all nonsense. Indeed, the truth is that we are valuable merchandise. And have you seen the prices in the market? I know it. I cost more than $2,000. And can you imagine a fool, let me excuse the expression, a fool of a master who would whip and maim a capital of over $2,000? No! If a slave is a respectable slave, his master treats him with kid gloves because it takes only one scar, one single scar, and plop. Down shoots the price. You know, the client is suspicious. But, sir, surely you must realize the injustice of your situation, the violation of your liberty, your freedom. If you speak of freedom, sir, I must tell you something. I am a worker, and workers are not free and never will be. If you speak of my condition, I will quickly say, I don't pay taxes. I'm housed, fed, and clothed by my employer. I work a short week. My medical care is free. I get a Christmas bonus and retirement or permanent disability at the expense of my employer. Without mentioning this, that in time of war, I am not even obligated to military service. Oh, but if, if you're not even paid. You know, I see the ones which you gentlemen call freed slaves or liberated workers out from morning till night, working like horses to make ends meet. And they never do. So, just tell me then, what's the difference between us slaves and liberated workers? Huh? You should be ashamed of yourself. Who? Me? Yes, you. You're a dishonor to your race. We're waving that camera around, will you? All right, but with all the, the, the thousands of tormented slaves that are in this country, we have to run into that puppet, that wretched collaborator. <laughs> Corpus Domini Nostri, Jesu Christi, Cusore et Haimu Tuo, Corpus Domini Nostri, Jesu Christi, Cusore et Haimu Tuo, Corpus Domini Nostri, Jesu Christi, Cusore et Haimu Tuo, Corpus Domini Nostri, Jesu Christi, Cusore et Haimu Tuo, Corpus Domini Go and change the plate now, son. Corpus Domini Nostri, Jesu Christi, Custodia Raleon, Tuo, Mi Vita, Mi Terra, Corpus Domini Nostri, Jesu Christi, Custodia Raleon, Tuo, Mi Vita, Mi Terra, Amen.
listen to this, I'm, I'm quoting Hewitt. When work is finished, the slaves are allowed to congregate and perform religious rites which are merely a primitive African version of Christianity. Experience shows that the more religious a slave is, the more humble, resigned, and docile he is. However, the law prescribes that these devotions shall be monitored by a white man. And there he is. This elemental parody of the master's religion, Jesus, the gospel, the Bible, are all mixed together. Look at this. Africa instead of Palestine, the ocean instead of the Red Sea, slave ships and sharks instead of Romans, Egyptians, and so on. Here the plantation, instead of Golgotha, represents the place of Jesus' agony. And instead of Herod, the master with crosses, flagellations, and other delights. What do the masters say to that? Does it or does it not prove they have souls? And the best person to answer that is the most eminent scientific authority of the day, Professor Samuel Cartwright, born in Jackson, Mississippi in 1802, died in Charleston, South Carolina in 1876. Why do you say he died? Ah, of course, the Italians come, come. As you know, it's only a question of time. On the other hand, I hope to be speaking with people who have a basic understanding of this argument. Yeah. Tom, how are we going with the perspiration? Ready, Professor. Now, ah, good. How about a smell? Is that a human odor? Or an animal odor? To speak more clearly, is the pH acid or alkaline? Naturally, it's acid. Answer, as a matter of fact, one square centimeter of this skin has twice the number of sweat glands as this skin. And you do not need a microscope to see the limited cranial capacity and the vile wool that covers it, this low forehead. Or the eyes, completely lacking in any blue pigment. Or the animal-like nose, with its dirty, wide nostrils. And the abnormally strong teeth. And this almost Neanderthal jaw. Are all characteristics of a subhuman race. A race far inferior to our own. A race that is but another example of nature's innumerable attempts to obtain perfection. Ah, nature loves perfection. The perfection of the European Homo sapiens, the white race, us. Excuse us, Professor, but aren't you Jewish? Yes, but why? Imagine we'd want to rid ourselves of them. You wouldn't have to use atrocious methods like gas or deportation. It would suffice simply not to cure the diseases which infest the specimens here in this laboratory. Remember, and I've written this, a healthy Negro is a good slave, and a bad slave is a sick Negro. For example, look at them. Their disease is drapetomania or the mania to escape. They think only of escape, but not out of an idea of freedom which is understandable in a human. The Negro doesn't have these sentiments. If he escapes, he escapes only because he is sick. Ah, now here is a perfect example of cachexia africana, or dirt eating. What do they do, bite? Oh, no. Oh. This is not a muzzle. No, no, no. It's simply to keep them from devouring every sort of refuse, including their own excrement and dirt. It's a form of unconscious suicide, brought on by a lack of some substance of which we know nothing. Ah, there you are, little bird. There you are. Oh, boy. 
And look how far they'll go. Their fear of work and their laziness are such that they've succeeded in outwitching their masters. Now, what do you think of that? Look at these sly foxes. <laughs> they willingly lose arms, legs, hands and feet. See how they abuse themselves to get out of work. Then, of course, their masters have to take care of them. Come along. But how could they possibly mutilate themselves to this extent? Didn't I tell you? <laughs> they gave themselves superficial wounds to avoid work. But then they got gangrene and arms and legs had to be amputated in order to save their lives. <laughs> What are they doing here? They're Indians. Ah, this is one of my many unsuccessful experiments. You see, with Indians, there's absolutely nothing to be done. There's the same difference between a Negro and an Indian as there is between a dog and a coyote. You can put a dog on a leash, beat him, and he'll always be there to lick your feet. Take away a coyote's liberty and you've cut off his air. An Indian will never be a slave. No one has ever been able to make them reproduce in captivity. They do not eat, they do not talk, they do not sleep, they do not make love. On the other hand, these people exaggerate. The Negro boasts of an enormous member, not realizing that this is the result of still another disease, which is Aeromania elephantina sudanensis. Oh, by the way, I invented this. It's to keep them away from their genitals, so they can play with themselves. <laughs> they have such enormous sexual activity, both fornication and uh, sodomy, that they very, very soon in life, right from infancy, start to develop something that is quite remarkable, a very enormous penis which causes lack of potency. Naturally, all of this is a great impediment to reproduction. <laughs> Look at them, these extraordinary creatures, neither man nor beast, that ask to be part of our world. They're as old a race as we, and yet until yesterday, they'd never seen a wheel. And their future, they have no future, as they have no past. Tomorrow, as today, slavery will be their only possible privilege. What could they ever do if they don't live in the reflections of our glory and profit by the crumbs from our well-laden table? <laughs> page 971. Many of the slaves who ran away from the plantations hid in the trackless swamps of Florida. To recapture them, the white men organized extensive manhunts. The most efficient method placed obedient slaves and domestic animals in simulated refugee camps among the mangroves. The most famous of these man traps was right here in the Brandon swamps, where voices and laughter and the smell of roasting pig served as a decoy to the hungry escapees. In fact, in a single morning, the hunters bagged 47 runaways. Thank <laughs> you. 
business that's going lake of display. Where it happened was cotton and tobacco went sick and it was either fish or cut bait. There was no question which I'd do. I turned this plantation into a breeding farm. And I must say it was a timely move because right after that they passed a new law prohibiting the importation of African Negroes. And of course that sent the market hey, sky pa! high. Pa! Hey, Pa! Mr. Wilton's coming! Hey there, Mr. Bighorn. I brought my wench. All right. Fetch her here. You've been keeping track of her. You're sure she's in heat. She's ready for breeding. <laughs> well, I hope so for your sake. You know, Wilson, if she doesn't take the first time, you're not going to like paying another stud fee. How many days ago did she finish? My missus counted 12. Should be 13 at most with the trip. You can get her mounted right away. I'll be back on the road in a couple hours. Is it for me, Pa? Easy. We'll talk about that when you finish school. Now you go and study. Doggone. Is she clean? Sure enough. Does she have crabs? For the love of God, I keep her in the house. <laughs> then she's a virgin? Of course. You know I've been saving her for Jason. What? A virgin for a brute like that? He'll split her up the middle. <laughs> he does, I'll sew her up. Come on, Mr. Bighorn. I could have serviced this wench two feet from my own back door for $50. If I've traveled 60 miles up country and I'm paying you $200 cash on the barrel head, it means I want Jason C. Anyway, it's my risk the way I see it. She's my worry. All right. That's your business. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, the three legged stallion. <laughs> Hi, Daddy. <laughs> How's old Mr. Bighorn's arthritis these days? A little better, since he's been draining it out of them and into the niggers. Now, you can't beat them nigger cubs for curing the arthritis. Could be, but then I find myself with a litter of crippled pups. <laughs> Look there. Where? Down in that box. Why? I don't know. These journalists always want you to look into that damned hole. Hey, Wilson, you wait for me at the breeding pen, you hear? I'll take these foreign gentlemen for a turn around the plantation. Fine, Mr. Bighorn. Hello, Father. They keep you busy on a Sunday. Hey, John. What's the matter with you these days? Well, it's been more than two weeks since I've seen you in church. I've had a lot to do. The work, Father. Too much work. Soon all this is going to be left. Yes, it must be embarrassing for a priest to have his church on a slave reading farm. No, on the contrary, he's quite content. I also pay him as sort of a guardian. Fact is, I need this space up near the big house for special breeding purposes. Good day, Elizabeth. <laughs> My wife is a little peeved with me because I gave orders to dig up the family graveyard. 
Doubt she'll ever forgive me. She's been there since yesterday in full morning, making sure that Grandpa's skull doesn't wind up with Aunt Charlotte's ribs. <laughs> Just imagine what fun it's going to be going to bed with an undertaker. <laughs> Bring me some sugar cane. These are vintage 43. Only lost about 25%. Usually 60% die. Measles does it. Don't hurt us human, but it kills these poor beasts. How come some of them are blonde? Well, you see, some are mine and some are my brothers from Pittsburgh land. And some are from passing guests, like you were saying. And the priest hasn't been losing any time either. All right, that's all now. <laughs> These fine brood mares are for the house and Mandinga stallions I purchased three years ago. 87% pregnant at any given time with an average interval between delivery and conception of less than 60 days. Hey, where are you? Ah, there you are. Now, this is what I call a really fine brood wench. Drops twins every year, and there are two in there again this time. She's worth a fortune. Uh, uh, Come on. Come over here. Uh, Look at this. Uh, what a chance you've got. Come and see how a little uh, bastard comes into the world. Beauty, eh? Must be about seven pounds. This one's dedicated to you. I'll call him Macaroni. <laughs> Good girl, Cleopatra. Who's the sire? Don't really know, Master. You had me covered by Pluto, only it didn't take. Then you had me pleasured by Nestor. Oh, and that's all right. To be sure. He's a beauty anyway. <laughs> See how your master keeps his word? It's a prize. A dollar a puff. An old family tradition. <laughs> this stock will get covered in the fall. They're eager for it now, but a good breeder can't hurt things. That's the way you ruin good bloodlines. Well, what bloodline are these? The big old strain. My new crossbreed won two blue ribbons at the Jackson County Fair. I'll show it to you. Hey, you, bring for bail. No, no, not that one. That one. No, idiot, that's it. I have 136 in stock, but this should give you an idea of the product. It takes talent to create a strain like this. The breeder must work with colors like an artist. A bit of white here, a bit of black there. Now a touch of red, there a whisper of white. Until out comes something which is neither black, nor white, nor red, nor yellow. But an indisputable masterpiece. <laughs> Look, the slave is running away. No, no, he's only terrified of the brand and I. New stallions are always a little skittish. You ready, Wilson? Shall we go? Been waiting for you. And the winch? Ready. That's good. Bring her along. Mm. All right. Let's go. Down, boy. Good boy, Casanova. 
These studs go wild with the smell of a wench. He's got more seed in him than a dozen bulls. They offered me 4,500 for him in Benson, but I wouldn't take it. Good old James, my champ. 200 pounds of muscle and not an ounce of fat. If I wanted, he could cover four or five wenches a day. But I'm not wasting him. Your wench ready? Ready as you'll ever be, Mr. Bighorn. Put in there. Put in there. Put in there. Put in there. Remember, Wilson, if he does any damage, that's your problem. I want you to be a nice little mayor. My name is Nat Turner. I intend to lay before you a full confession of my crimes. On August 21st, 1831, 55 whites were massacred by me and 70 other slaves. My profound hatred for whites was... My profound hatred for whites was... Pig bastards! My profound hatred was the will of God who ordered me to kill. Will of God. Let's see, 1831. If Cleaver, Leroy Jones, Malcolm X had lived 150 years ago like Nat Turner, would they have believed that their hatred of whites, men, women, and children was according to God's will? The slave Cleaver, like the slave Turner, would never have dared to admit that the order came not from heaven but from within himself. Now then, on the evening of August 21st, we advanced an Indian file through the corn and lined up right in front of the Trevis Mansion. The night before, God had given me a clear sign that this was to be our first target. We knew we would find the Trevis baby in the house and the master's wife, Sarah. Who knows if today's whites are really any different than they were in Nat Turner's time? Or better yet, let's say that today's whites are different. Would there be this difference if Nat Turner had never existed? Come on. Would they have let me go to their schools, become a doctor, earn a decent living, have a nice house, a wife, children, well-nourished and healthy? Nelson, Sam, Jake, Hark and me, we climb quietly through the dining room window. 
Will, who was bringing up the rear, stumbled and fell over the table, still cluttered with supper dishes. I was scared old man Travis would wake up, because Will was still stumbling around, making one hell of a racket. But old Travis went right on sleeping next to his wife when Sam and Jake tiptoed in. And it was like the sleep of the just, deep and untroubled. And it occurred to me even then that his harsh, regular snoring was a sound that was familiar since my childhood. In Washington this morning, violence broke out as a large group of young militant black... Oh, here we are. Sam and Jake tiptoed in. No, where was I? That old man had practically raised me. And he was a kind and gentle master. But he was still white, and for that he had to die. Old man Travis, like all whites, never even imagined that a slave, an obedient creature without courage or dignity, might one day rebel against his master. And so the only reaction that came to his mind, still foggy with sleep, was disbelief. When... about to to leave the house when Hawk ran back toward the sound of a baby crying. We had almost forgotten about the baby. After the massacre at the Trevis Plantation, our next objective was... Those idiots again. After the massacre at the Trevis Plantation, our next objective was the slaughter of the Reese family. Reese was a cruel and foolish master who amused himself by tormenting his slaves with all sorts of stupid jokes. His wife and his sister-in-law, two asinine creatures, <laughs> encouraged this disgusting show-off, shrieking and squealing like stuck pigs. In front of the Reese mansion, I swore that I would no longer show weakness in carrying out God's will. I was ready to spill blood. I hated Reese, who had forced me to take part in his humiliating games. I should have refused, rebelled, but how can a slave... Don't be afraid, friend. It's just a joke. Oh, just a joke. I want you to take a picture of me and the girls, huh? Now, you just take the camera and you look through this end and flash, you push the button, all right? Come on, fella. One picture of me and the girls together, huh? Come on, be a good sport. I should have refused, Come on. rebelled. Be a good job, huh? Come on, fella. But how can a slave... Come on. Come on. Oh, wait, wait now. Hold it there just one minute. Oh, yeah. When is he going to get down? Reese was a cruel and foolish master. Oh, oh. Oh, no, 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 no
Margaret, Nat Turner's first and only victim. Today they say that Nat Turner killed not for hate, but for love. Who knows why we blacks can't swallow this story? Now then, Nat Turner practically a nursemaid for little Margaret, but black and therefore unsuspected of feeling desire for that young white girl who romped around him the whole day long. <laughs> this girl is in love with her boy. She won't tell you who he is. No, yes, you no, no. are. How she excited him without ever knowing it. Where are you, Nat? Come here, Nat, and see my new dress. Am I pretty? Come on, Nat, drive me up in Aunt Rose's. <laughs> no, 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 I'll ride in the box with you. Now move over, little Nat. There, you see, there's plenty of room for both of us. <laughs> she and Nat, skin almost touching skin, the wind in that blonde hair, and that white throat he wanted so desperately to touch. Oh, 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 Nat, she said to me one day while her nearness and that youthful scent of lavender made my flesh taut. Oh, Nat, why are Negroes born to such misery? Why in this bright springtime are they but fallen flowers? Did you see what they did? Daddy, read. I'll catch you. I <laughs> <Black> bastard. <laughs> Let's see. If I, if I, 140 years later, was in love with that white girl, so much in love I couldn't live without her, but just because I'm black like Nat Turner, <laughs> I can see it now. Sir, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Nat Turner. I love your daughter, and I intend to marry her. <laughs> <laughs> we decided that the Withers Plantation was our next target, and we moved forward invisible in the deep shadows of the oak grove that flanked three sides of the house. Margaret had just come home for summer vacation from Southampton College. When we spotted her father, he was too excited by his daughter's arrival. <laughs> much too busy welcoming her home and showing her how much she was loved to take notice of us. I was looking for Margaret. She was hiding around the corner of the house. When I finally spied her, she ran. Light and quick as the wind, through the rows of corn. I ran, following the bright sunlight in her hair. After that flashing face had turned to look at me, I ran faster than she. And then I caught up with her. I must. I must. I must. I must kill you. Because I love you. Because you're white. Your Honor, before you condemn me to the gallows, you asked me if I repented. Well, in all sincerity, I can only answer that if I could return 